David is very, I mean, David takes the position that um, um, Barack Obama offers what he calls a, a new discourse. Um, I basically do a close analysis of the text and conclude that he's pandering. Um, and if you look at what he says about race, uh, the, the three things that he says are, um, well, the first reference to race is, and this is a quote, I believe, slaves singing freedom songs around a campfire. The second reference is to a young black kid shouldn't feel that he can't be smart because smart is not good. And the third is the alignment of the African American experience with the white European immigrant experience. None of those things are accurate, um, sustained in the research, and in fact, they tie into a conception of race which um, is comforting and comfortable. Um, add that to the fact that President Obama, the first biracial president of the United States, is openly against reparations, and I think you know where I stand on that. I think that we have come a long way to have elected Obama and gotten so close as we did with Hillary Clinton. Um, we were talking last night about this, and, and there, there, there were uh, some varied opinions on that. Um, it, however, a lot of what was going on in the 2008 election was absolute desperation about the economy. And that is the predictor almost every time about how people are going to vote whether or not they will keep sort of an incumbent party or not. And so Obama was able to get the Democratic um, candidacy um, by incredible use of the internet and by using new media to the max, actually bringing in new voters, people who had been sidelined. There's a lot of fantastic material about what he did in order to um, bring new people into the fold. Um, however, it is also true that the, that, that the economy was absolutely tumbling and people were afraid. Uh, whether or not that's going to uh, work for him or against him in the coming election is, I think, a big question. So I, I think, uh Again, I, th I think he did a little better in the Philadelphia speech, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but by then he was a candidate, um, uh, it, you know. But I, I also think that in terms of kind of leaving Obama out of it, I don't think that I don't think it's a question about Obama. It's a question about where we are. Uh, although I, I think that if you look at the way Obama is treated in the media itself. Uh, I don't think there's any question but that we haven't arrived. Uh, uh, I think that uh, he is uh, subjected to, I mean, I, it's, hard for me to, it's hard for me to think about kind of how I used to talk about George Bush. And, but I don't think I or anybody in the media ever subjected him to the vitriol and the, the hatred and the narrowly disguised animus that is heaped upon Barack Obama. And uh, you know, I think that, to me, is, a, is an indication that we really, we really aren't there yet. You know. In the back? So the, que the question has to do with the, 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 the diversity debate, uh, and I guess around affirmative action, and you're t thinking about the 
kind of case that's perking up around affirmative action. Yeah, uh, you know, somebody asked that question last night, and you know, I don't know a great deal of detail about that case. So, um, you know, I think uh, I. So, so a couple of things. One, let's. I mean, diversity and affirmative action are two different things, right? Uh, the question about what diversity means, I think, is a difficult one to define anyway, and it's variable depending upon what your perspective is. Uh, affirmative action uh, ha is a kind of historical event. I mean, it's con continuing to play out. Uh, it, it, it comes out of a particular context. I, I think it was severely limited to begin with. Uh, you know, and, you know, as I said last night, one of the problems is you know, affirmative action in the, in the higher education context uh, actually, you know, might actually have accomplished something in terms of uh, opening up opportunities and the retrenchment in affirmative action has accomplished the opposite. It has kind of diminished the number of people of color with access to higher education. So on that level, regardless of what I think of affirmative action, I think the case is a little scary, all right? Uh, on, on, the, on the topic of diversity, I, I'll, I'll give one little anecdote, and then I'll turn and let Mark talk. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, as you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm at Harvard, and uh, I'm also a big basketball fan, and uh, I'm a big fan of the Harvard basketball team, which m most people might think is pretty funny, but they're pretty good. Uh, and they're in the news, right? Because they had this guy named Jeremy Lin, Right, uh, who went to Harvard? I saw him play all the time. My son played with him and all this stuff. And he's now in the NBA, right? And he's a big star. And Ben and Jerry's uh, locally uh, created a, 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 a Lin Sanity flavor ice cream. Anybody hear about this? Yes, it, you hear about yeah. it? Did, it's interesting because it became it became it, it remained very local. Well, it, it didn't last long because the germ, the Lin Sanity ice cream was made with fortune cookies. Right, which caused great umbrage among, <laughs> among certain populations, and you know, it occurred to me as, uh, when I when I when I heard about it, I thought to myself, this is the strongest argument I've ever heard for the need to have a diverse workforce, right? Because at the point at which somebody said, "Hey, let's have some insanity ice cream with some fortune cookies in it," maybe if you had some Asian Americans in the room, they might have said, "Whoa, wait a minute, not such a good idea." Let's think of something else, right? And, and again, as I thought about that example, I, I thought about, well, what, what would I do? I mean, there's a marketing, there's an issue here. I mean, this is in Cambridge, you know, let's make some money off of Jeremy Lin, right? And so I thought to myself, well, what's, what is it about Jeremy Lin? Jeremy Lin is Asian. He's unusual in the NBA because he's Asian, and why else? Because he's from Harvard. So make a crimson ice cream, right? And, and, and everybody in Cambridge would get it. So there are lot, and again, it's a, it's a question of, of what, you know, kind of who's in the room, what the level of thinking is, what the level of sensitivity is. And, and that, to, to tell you the truth, I mean, that's a, you know, it, it really did bring it home to me why on some level uh, having different people in the room is really important. And that's true in the classroom, that's true in the jury box, that, that's true wherever you are. And uh, you know there are other examples of that that bring it home. Whether the Supreme Court, you know, uh, I mean, in fact, in the, in the Grutter case, a lot of the briefs that were filed uh, by corporations made just that point, right? That we 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 you know for, from a business point of view, and you know we we need those voices there, or we're going to make these fortune cookie kind of blunders. Right? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, I think that these the upcoming Supreme Court case is likely with the more conservative court to strike down affirmative action in higher education. It is uh, definitely scary um, because we can see that in the 10 years since the last uh, sort of uh, retrenchment, if you will, on affirmative action, at the University of Michigan, for example, there's less than 10% of the population of the school is African American actually minority, including everybody that's that's non-white, and of the African Americans that are there, um, less than two percent actually graduate in four years. So, it has there has been a loss. There has been a distinct loss since the time that we began to um, 
to stop allowing there to be some kind of leap for people who have had less access to privilege? Well, John Kennedy's executive order was meant to try in some small way to address a history of injustice. I mean, black people were enslaved, then denied jobs, and it wasn't done by a few people running around in sheets, it was done by the state, it was done by institutions. He was trying to make right. So the retrenchment against affirmative action in my mind is like breaking someone's leg, giving them a cane, and then saying that they're moving too fast. There's no attempt to address what has been done in the past, and until that happens, this country will never deal with its racial problem. It's just not gonna happen, folks, because we can't just get over it. It's not all in the past. It's not that it's not a problem anymore. It is what undermines our ability to achieve the basic principles which we hold dear, which we claim are inalienable. We can never fulfill those ideals until we do it in practice. Uh, Richard Rorty, who, who's a philosopher, wrote a book called the, um, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, puts it best. The only criterion of truth is coherence. If what you say and what you do don't amount to the same thing, it ain't true. And we have a story about ourselves, and um, it was uh, Stephen Carter who wrote this in uh, his um, preface to Lonnie Guineer's book. We have a story about who we are as Americans, and it's not who we really are. And until we deal with who we really are around these issues of race and other issues, issues of gender, issues of class, issues of classification, issues of identity, we are not an inclusive democratic society. We have never been. And until we change what we do in action, we won't be. So let me actually piggyback on one part of that too, which is to say <clears throat> uh, uh, one of these questions about kind of whether we've arrived, I mean, this, the cane uh, analogy made me think of it, um, it, it has to do with wealth in this country, right? So even though there's a huge income gap, you know, you know uh, there's an even bigger wealth gap, right? So the income gap might be narrowing. And if you think about where the wealth gap came from, in point of fact, uh, you know, we can look at, in, at, 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 we can trace it historically, right? What, what's, the, what's the greatest vehicle to wealth in this country Inheritance. for an individual? Hmm? Inheritance. Inheritance of what? What, what, what? Most Americans, even those who don't inherit, if they have wealth, what's their wealth in? Their houses, right? Property. Their property, right? So we, we have a situation in this country where following World War II, uh, the government embarked on a, on, a, on a program to create mortgages for people, to let people get mortgages. How many of you have seen the, the series Race the Power of an Illusion? So you know where I'm going, right? All right, so, so the government created a policy that allowed GI Joes to come home and buy houses, right? 